<laughs> Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Quinn Peters, I'm a UX designer and information architect. I'm currently working, living and working in Brussels. Um, I've been working at a company called Mamam for about uh, 13 years now. And um, it's a company of about uh, 25 people. We do human-centered design of digital products and services. Human-centered design means we design products. It could be uh, anything, uh, a software application or a website or an intranet, uh, you name it. Um, we try to design it from a user perspective. We look at uh, user needs, um, the context in which a user is going to use a product or a service, and we try to adapt our design solution to that. So, uh, just to avoid misunderstanding, uh, I generally believe that at a Drupal conference, uh, most talks are about Drupal, <laughs> but this one is not. Um, I think uh, it's not it's not all about technology. Um, um, I've never built a Drupal site um, in my life. I've worked a bit with people. Uh, with Peter um, uh, is one of them, uh, Drupal developers in, in projects. Um, but it will not be about Drupal, uh, just to make that clear. But I'm not going to say that again, but maybe I'm chasing away even more people. So <laughs> we're only 10 or something like that. Uh, but anyway, if you're a Drupal purist, I mean, now's the time to go. Um, but I will talk about uh, co-creation. It's the first time that I gave this talk. Uh, I will give it um, again um, in about 10 days uh, at the Euro IA conference in Edinburgh. So I welcome all feedback at the end of the session. Uh, let me know what you think, what you thought, what your thoughts are, uh, what you think of it. Uh, now the basic idea of co-creation is that you, as a design company, that you try to involve a client directly in the design process and by having him co-create the solution. So not uh, act as lone designers, but involve the client and have them uh, work on the design uh, themselves as well. So Naman as a company has evolved towards uh, co-creation in these last few years and as a matter of fact it has well, changed quite drastically the way we work with, uh, with clients yeah. and um, I would like to use the, it's not publicity for Naman or for the offices, but I would like to use the Naman offices to illustrate how, we, how we've changed uh, in the way that we work with clients. Um, we, um, our offices are near Madhu in Brussels uh, in a former print shop and here you can see the uh, um, it was around the year uh, 2000, uh, it was uh, one year before I uh, joined NAMA, so I didn't, I didn't see that happy moment. Uh, but um, we, um, here you see the NAMA library, um, and also the desks um, that are in the different offices. Um, and they kind of, when you look at them, they really represent the way we, well, we were then, or how we saw ourselves, I think. Um, it was done together with a, with a, with a good architect, with Wim Kuyvers. Um, and he, well, he did a good job, but it represented the way we worked then. And that is, well, first of all, there's a library with physical books, a place of silence where you can study and, and read, but also with tables, so where you can meet internally or meet with, with the client. Um, in, mostly, in, you show the results of the work you've done, and you re review it around the table. And the desks, um, um, yeah, and the library, well, you could say it's a, a modern and trendy environment. Uh, a nice looking and receiving, uh, uh, inviting uh, uh, space. And then the desks, well, um, they kind of represent what you could uh, uh, call the idea of the, the lone genius designer who works on his own, on his own island, in his own box, uh, so to speak, um, where he does his magic, <laughs> if that exists. Um, and later on, he, he, he meets the client and shows the designs and they review it in the library, right? So, uh, and then there's even, a, there's even a mirror, so you can from time to time look at yourself and say, well, I'm a great designer or something like that. Now, I have to be honest, uh, um, and in those days, uh, around 2000, we didn't just do um, um, user-centered design, we also offered technical writing as a service. And of course, a desk like that makes more sense in the context of, uh, of writing text and being able to concentrate and not being distracted by colleagues and things like that. 
Now, if you look at um, since 2009, if you look at the offices now, the back part of the of the building um, we didn't use that up to 2009, and then there were some extra offices. The, the back part of the print shop was renovated as well, and one of the new spaces is a design studio. And uh, this is a multifunctional room with almost 60 um, uh, uh, multifunctional door panels that you can write on as whiteboards. You can put them against the wall, or you can make tables out of it on different heights. Um, so. It, it's a different room from the from the other two things that I showed you, uh, that I've shown you just now, and it's because the UX design world has changed as well. Um, the challenge is not making good design anymore. I mean, there are plenty of examples ready available on the web. You, you, um, there's much more readily available and usability. Um, it's not that difficult anymore. Uh, as a subject. Many people can do it. It's, it's, it's become more low thresholds. And um, what clients want now is not just a good design, but they um, they want a, a, a design that's really tailored to their own needs and to their own context, and they want to have a say in it. They want to you know, decide together with you about the design, and not uh, wait until, the, until you come up with the, the good solutions. And so the design studio um, at Maman kind of allows for this kind of interaction with the clients. Um, so, and in, uh, one other thing that changed is in our offices, uh, the black desks um, are gone now. Um, when we have new young people starting at Nama, um, they hate it. Yeah. They, they, they couldn't understand why we, what we've put up with these desks. Uh, they, they called it uh, like uh, funeral coffins, like black coffins. And um, so, um, whereas this is the way of uh, the way we work now with clients, um, not in, in formal meetings, but more um, work together with them and trying to find a solution for, for come up with a good design together. So here's my colleague Leo uh, putting an end to the era of the black, uh, the black desks. Uh, that's a few, like half a year ago, something like that. So um, we make use of this design studio space to to hold uh, co-creation workshops. Um, there are some other terms for that. I'm not going to dive into that participatory design or collaboration, cooperation, co-design. Um, but that's not. Uh, I don't want to go into the nitty-gritty details of that. My main point is that. Um, um, well, I'll talk about co-creation, which means creating a solution for a problem together with a client. And what I want to say is about it is that it's not something you do ad hoc or at the beginning of the process, like typically what, what has been done for many years, like a brainstorm with the client. So in what direction do we want to go with this product um, before the redesign? Kind of, you know, have these uh, strategy or vision workshops at the beginning of the process. No. What we do, what we're doing at Nama now, is using these co-creation techniques throughout the full process, not just in the beginning. And that's one of the. It's it's, it's it has become fully part of our uh, uh, methodology. And so, if you look at uh, the Nama design process, you can broadly, well, or any design process, it's, it has broadly uh, uh, three phases. First, an understand phase, uh, understanding the problem, getting to know the user, what, uh, observe the user, see what the user needs are. Um, then exploring possible solutions. Um, could be, if it's for Drupal, for a website, for instance, uh, explore possible architectures for, you, for your website, uh, look at different ways of organizing the information, sketching a uh, um, uh, first trial for, uh, for, for screen designs. Um, and then, in the end, you define the solution you've come up with, and you specify it, and you prototype in detail um, um, you know, your new design solution. Now, what we want to do is, or what we do now, is have techniques throughout this process, not just uh, at the beginning, not just as a brainstorm, but also at different moments. Um, and I'll explain a bit of these uh, techniques in detail in a minute. So, um, why co-creation? Why is that useful? Why this shift of approach? Well, first of all, it allows you to get buy-in with the client. You get your solution accepted, by and sold to a client. It helps, it really helps. When they've been involved and they've been co-creating the solution together with you, obviously they're going to uh, be more enthusiastic about it. Uh, also, and this is a quote from IDEO, uh, IDEO's Tim Brown, um, if you try to solve complex problems, um, you need multiple minds working together to arrive at the best uh, solution. And I think that's true. And we were not asked for, for uh, simple 10-page websites. We were usually asked, uh, 
and the minds help us ask for more complex situations. And then it's always better to have different perspectives and different people involved. Um, this is an important one as well, uh, a reason for um, adopting this co-creation approach. That is, uh, give it, it gives the client the feeling that he's making it himself, but he's, he's also almost only the solution because he, he worked on it together with you. So co-ownership. Um, it also uh, creates a momentum in, in, in the team you're working with. Um, um, it gives kind of an extra drive to, to the project. And in most cases, they're not used to working together with people from different departments like that in, in such a way. And so there's a kind of an, it brings the, the departments closer together and it brings kind of an enthusiasm into the, the project. And in some cases, it allows you to go a bit lighter on deliverables. If the, if, if, if the team of, of the client you're working with has been involved in these co-creation workshops, um, they better understand uh, the solution and they, they know the reasoning behind it. So it allows you to, you know, you don't have to specify it all uh, too much in detail anymore. Kind of allows for a more lighter, more agile approach. So let me explain you a bit how, how you can tackle this and how you can do this and, and show you what you need for a co-creation workshop before I enter and, and, and demonstrate a few techniques. So what do you need? Well, first you need the participants, um, mainly from the client side, of course, uh, members of the core team you're working with, but also representatives of of the different departments, of other departments, maybe that are not taking the lead in this project, but that, uh, that are concerned. Um, so it's a mix of business, ICT, marketing, um, and if possible, it's not always possible, um, but if possible, also a few users, because they, uh, they can uh, bring along their perspective uh, to the table. Um, you, of course, need also a, a good moderator, because it's a bit different. You need a designer with workshop facilitation skills. Um, but I'll come back to that uh, in the end of my talk. Um, you, you need to change a bit as a designer as well. Um, you need uh, other skills than just being a good designer. And then one other thing that I wanted to say about it is it's not just about the people you're working with uh, from the clients. It's not just about uh, only about their roles, uh, what department they are. It's also what type of persons they are. Um, so um, a, a good team ideally is, uh, consists of a mix of, for instance, introverts and extroverts. Um, it preferably you have a mix of, of men and women. And um, it's always good to have a, an, an, an analytic thinker um, who kind of thinks of all the details and, and think, thinks things through. Um, so um, then the workshop space, um, I already explained a bit how we work now with the design studio and how it's uh, uh, built up. You need a workshop space that is inviting and that allows for uh, creativity. Uh, and so that's why we usually we try to take a client away from their own office and invite them to now to our design studio. Why? Well, um, usually the meeting rooms look like this and Peter is going to recognize them uh, because <laughs> it's uh, well, a meeting room that we, where we often met with uh, with the client we, we worked uh, for together. Um, but it's, I mean, it's representative, it's, it's from the European Commission, or one of the DGs. Um, if you look at this, um, it, you look, you see that it's made for meetings. I mean, it's not, it, it's like, almost like it's made to be, or it's, it, it's kind of blocks creative. Uh, uh, it, it avoids in all ways to, 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 to have a creative meeting. The tables are, arranged in such a way that, you, that they're difficult to move. They're not fixed to the ground, but they're almost never moved. And whenever I was there, they were always in the same place. And they're full of, it's full of tables. Um, once you're seated, I mean, you can't move around anymore. The, the, the chairs are quite close to the wall. And um, there's a tiny whiteboard. If you're lucky, there are some markers around. Sometimes somebody has written on it with a, with a permanent marker. So that's pretty much the situation that you have. Um, there's no daylight. There's, no fresh air, the, the, the technique that they use is, it's a door that closes automatically, so they put uh, a chair in front of the door to allow for some, some fresh air. So that's not what you need uh, for, uh, you know, for co-creation. What, what you need is the opposite. You need daylight, you need an inviting space, and a space that allows for, for being creative, and come up with ideas. And a, a, a space that you don't feel imprisoned, like a bit like here, it's a bit depressing. Uh, 
uh, this uh, this room here. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> I hope my talk will not be depressive. Uh, uh, will not depress you. Anyway, uh, a third thing that you need is stuff um, um, to, to run a workshop. You need materials, um, and this this is these are different things. Of course, pens and papers, post-its, uh, markers, erasable markers, but also uh, uh, Toy-like things, Lego, uh, Kapla uh, blocks, or um, Playmobil, uh, Play-Doh, or, or wires, these kind of things. And that's stuff that we have ready um, in our design studio. It's stuff that allows you to be creative and to you know, come up with ideas and, and show things, illustrate things. And what you also will need is uh, uh, workshop tools, um, uh, templates and posters. That's things that we usually prepare in advance. And as, as I'll show you the techniques, you'll, you'll notice that um, that we're using a lot of templates and, and posters. Um, you'll see some of them. Um, and you'll also need uh, a device or a few devices to register the results of the workshops. Um, so um, I usually use my, my, my smartphone, which has a 8 megapixels camera, which is decent, and has a good audio recorder. And that's, in most cases, enough. Sometimes you need video recording, so um, then you, with a flip or a, what was it, a, a, a GoPro, that's something that we use. Uh, Regularly now. So those, those are the, the things you need. Let me show you now a, a few techniques that we've been using ourselves lately. Um, and they've been listed here. It's an overview. You can, um, you can see that they're at different moments in the process, as I said. And I'll explain most of them in, in detail. Um, so a first technique um, is a technique that helps you answer the question, what is it the design channels really in this project? And we call it the framing game. So you frame the context of your project, and you set the boundaries by building kind of a context map. Um, let me explain that a bit more in detail. That means um, in this map, or in this context map, you're going to include uh, target groups, stakeholders, the departments that are involved, maybe suppliers, um, and also the locations where they're at and from where they're working. And you try to get a common understanding about uh, the project from the perspective of the organization. So, um, what is there exactly at the moment? For whom is it there? Um, by whom is it done? And in what location is it done? And um, there are two ways of doing it. You can start from scratch and use the, um, the post-its uh, and the couple, etc. Uh, and the Lego. Or you can prepare facet cards, simple facet cards, that, um, on which you put the things that you already know, um, the different the people that are involved, the locations, maybe the main products, so that you have them on the side, and that makes it a bit easier, and you can more quickly um, create uh, the context maps. And then usually afterwards we make a, a clean digital version of the, of the context map as, been, uh, um, as it has been uh, created, um, so that we can use it later on in the project as well. So an example um, of such a project um, is uh, this one. Uh, we did a framing exercise for Transix. That was about software for the transport sector. And um, so the, you had the back office, you had shippers, you had chauffeurs, and they were all using their own tools. They were all using different tools. And this exercise helped us a bit um, to map out all those different tools and who is using what exactly. Um, and here you see... Um, is this not? Oh, okay, there it is. Here you see um, a part of the digital cleanup version. So that's the first technique. A second one is the lotus blossom. Um, and that is a simple uh, brainstorm technique to create ideas in a, in, in a structured way. So you find ideas by association, basically. Um, it's developed it's, uh, by a Japanese guy, so that's why probably it's a lotus blossom and not some other kind of flower, I suppose. Um, it's not too difficult. Uh, the way it works is you put a core word uh, here in, in the center, and you do a first brainstorm. What, what concepts um, do you associate with this core word, or what ideas or what words do you associate with it? And once you have eight words or concepts, you copy these to the outer flowers in the center, and then you can start brainstorming again about uh, these uh, eight words. So it's a, a, a pretty simple technique, but the advantage is that it's, uh, it's allows you to brainstorm within a structured way, not in a chaotic way. Because usually a brainstorm tend to go a bit in all directions and at the end you don't know what, you, what you've come up with actually. Um, you can also use this lotus blossom a bit differently. Um, 
uh, for instance, for a service you're designing. Um, and this is an example with the European Commission, with uh, uh, Digicom. So we were uh, brainstorming about what the service offering could be of a newly formed web team. So they've just formed a web rationalization team that's going to offer services to uh, the different DGs at the Commission. And uh, they, they're still figuring out what, what the service exactly is that they're going to offer. And we used uh, this uh, brainstorming technique for that. What we did is first, uh, we brainstormed around, uh, or we tried to find eight requirements or characteristics. What should be um, the key requirements or characteristics of our service? For instance, um, you see uh, quality. And then in the second step, we, um, we asked them to, to think of uh, models from the real world that made them think of quality. For instance, in this case, they, they took uh, Amazon. And then we started brainstorming around Amazon. What, why is Amazon so good? What do you like about Amazon? Um, what are qualities of, of Amazon? And we did that for the eight requirements that they came up with, and the, the eight models that they associated with each quality. And that kind of gave, gave valuable in, um, input for, you know, to, to think of what kind of service we could, uh, we could make. So it's, it helps people to, um, in creative thinking when they're not used to it, um, because it kind of structures you and it helps you out. Uh, um. Okay, the third technique is, um, and with this technique we are getting a bit closer to a real Drupal website. Uh, it's collaborative uh, uh, mind mapping, that's the way we call it. Um, it's a technique that I've been using for some years now. Uh, so basically, um, you sit together in a group, in a, with a group of people, with people who know the content well, uh, content experts, and you discuss and start a group and order information or content using a mind map that is projected on the, uh, on the big screen. So as you are um, um, listing content and grouping it and ordering it, uh, people can uh, you know, give their comments and, 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 and you can see live what happens. So um, usually the result of such uh, such an exercise is that you have some kind of sitemap for, uh, for your website and also maybe a list of the main content objects and their main metadata. Um, and you know, I like the tool, or I like using a, a mind map because it's uh, very easy to manipulate. You can, you, know, you can move things around, you can try things out. For instance, well, let's order everything by target audience and then you can try it out and see, well, maybe that doesn't work, so you can move things back. And people can see and, and can contribute to the structure as you're doing it uh, live. Um, and that's why, because you're involving all these people, it's, good, it's a good uh, way of consensus building. Um, usually you need um, several of these workshops to, to end up with a, a full sitemap. So it's important that when you use this technique, that after each workshop that you document um, kind of the criteria that you've used for, uh, for the solution that you've come up with at that moment, um, what are the reasons, what's the rationale behind the IA uh, as it is now? And so that you can send it to, to the participants so that they can have a look at it and maybe bring some new ideas in for the next workshop. Um, another IA-related technique, information architecture-related technique, is cores and paths. And now the central idea of this technique is, is very simple. Um, when you're creating a site, you don't start by designing a navigation from, uh, on the homepage. That's basically the starting point. That's what most people do. They think of a top-down structure, and they think of the home page. Well, here we do the opposite. We, we don't start from the home page. We don't start from the top-down navigation, but you start from the core. It's the real, the core is the real reason why uh, um, your users or users come to your site. So first, you're gonna determine um, how, um, you're gonna detail a bit what, what is the core. And let me give you an example. For YouTube, it's pretty obvious. The video, people come to watch videos. For a bike store, an online bike store, the core would be bikes. So once you know what the core is, there may be several cores, by the way, but, um, you kind of detail a bit what should be in the core, what kind of content should be in there. You also determine how users will go to, uh, how users will get to the core. These are the inward paths. And you also look what, or, or, or consider what uh, uh, users will do next. Um, what are the call to actions when, once they are here? Maybe they want to share it with business friends, or they want to rate it, or they want to buy it, or, uh, or they will want to look at similar uh, uh, bike models. Um, 
So you do this uh, uh, technique in two steps. Uh, first, you um, we have a template for that. That's one of the workshop, uh, an example of a workshop template specifically made for uh, for a technique. Um, you describe the core. What's the core? Um, what is supplementary information? These are the inward parts, and these are the onward parts. And so you can you know divide up into groups and let people work on that. And once they've done that, you can take a second step, and you use the content that they uh, summarized in here to make a first sketch of the page design. And so in a few hours, um, in, in a co-creation workshop, you, you have a first idea of uh, what these pages, these core pages, these really important pages on your, on your website or on your internet, um, will, will look like. Um, storytelling is another technique that, we've, that, we've been that we have been applying successfully in co-creation workshops. Actually, we already started using that even before uh, we had a design studio. It's one of the first techniques that we've really been using a lot. Um, um, so what is that storytelling? Well, you jointly build up stories that, that lead to a common understanding of, of uh, how a product will be used in the future. Suppose that, you're, that the project is, um, and then I think of DigiDevCo, um, um, a project cycle management platform, an application that doesn't exist yet. Well, um, storytelling is a good way um, of, of kind of imagining what it would be like, um, and how this tool, um, who will be involved, what kind of tasks people will do in there. And, and not what it looks like. Um, you don't have to design, you're, 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 you're telling stories. And stories are a great means, are, are a great way to communicate. Um, um, you get an idea of what the tool will be without even having drawn uh, a line in the design or even written a line of code. Um, um, it's very easy to people to understand stories, and um, it's easy to, to, to talk about them and discuss them. And so that's why it works well. And if, that, if you compare that with like sketching, um, many people that we work with or that are involved, participants in co-creation workshops, they're often a bit intimidated when they have to, you know, pick up uh, a marker and start drawing an interface. They, they're not used to that. They're a bit uh, scared about that. They're, they're, um, they're not used to visualizing things. But writing a text, telling a story, that's something everyone can do, um, basically. And that's why this technique really works uh, well. What we usually do is also do it in two steps. First, we let uh, the participants create personas, kind of, uh, um, that kind of represent the users. You see a template for, uh, for personas that helps them do that. They can choose a picture with it, give it a name, say what the typical goals are of these uh, um, um, of this persona, what, her, what his concerns, uh, his or her concerns are. And then we um, ask them to uh, use these personas in their scenarios. And so storytelling, you can do that either in texts or written out narratives, or you can um, um, storyboard. But that's a bit, as I said, that's a bit more difficult usually for, uh, for people who are not used to um, drawing. Um, an interesting variant in storytelling, and, and, and Henry, you will recognize, I think you would have. Uh, that day, um, is uh, what we call serious play. So you brainstorm about a future service by developing scenarios, but you use visual three-dimensional props to kind of act out these scenarios. As you can see here uh, on, uh, on the picture. So um, basically you ask the workshops participants to visualize the service in three dimensions. And uh, again using uh, Lego and Playmobil and posters, etc. So in this example, it was again about this service offering for the, for the web rationalization team of the commission. And I think it, uh, it really worked well. Um, um, a lots of new interesting ideas came out of it. Uh, maybe it had to do also be, uh, to do with, uh, with the fact that some of the participants were very visual. They were used to sketching out things and, and doing these kind of exercises. That helped. But even with you know, people who are less used to do, doing that, they can still uh, usually come up with a very good result. And then the last technique that I'm going to show is the customer journey, or the customer journey map. And that fits more in the context of service design. So um, in, this type, in this type of exercise, you're going to look at the different touch points with the customers, and you map the customer journey. And you use then the typical journey steps in service design, like first there's a trigger, then awareness of a product. 
um, consider to buy it, then purchase it, then use the product and um, look for support and then loyalty. So those are like key moments you could say in the customer journey and you try to map um, and the customer journey looking at all the, the touch points between the client and the customer. Um, so here's an example um, that we did for Sony. So you can, you, it's mostly used in, in the context of service design, but you can also use this technique in the, outside the field of service design, for instance, in a typical interaction design project, where you have to design a user interface. In this case, it was for Sony. It was the, um, the support websites of, uh, of Sony Europe. So um, when there is an, like an experience that, that runs over time and that involves different um, contact points or different environments for a client, then it's interesting to do this, this kind of um, customer journey exercise. So uh, we did this for the Sony support site uh, and uh, we mapped the customer journey in a workshop with the client and uh, we used that as a starting point for, uh, for the redesign. Um, and, and this is then the, the digital version that came out of it. And so, for instance, for the Sony support website, um, normally you would expect, well, when you don't think it through, it's a, a site that they're going to use when they have a problem. But that's not the only moment at which people are going to look at the support site. Sometimes when they considering, uh, often when people are considering to buy a product, they also look at the support site. Is the support crap or is it, a, is it any good? Uh, will, I, will I get help when I have a problem? Also, um, is it compatible with the things I have right now? So there are different moments at which this uh, support channel is important. Um, for instance, one of the things we found out was that um, there was a clear split up between the product side, the commercial product side, and the support side. And that, was, that is not a good idea because when people are looking at a product and considering it to buy it, sometimes they immediately want to see the, the support information as well. So that was my overview of uh, well, the co-creation techniques we are currently using at Nama. We now come to the final part of my talk. Um, I would like to give you some best practices first, some tips and tricks for co-creation. So first one is um, when you organize these kind of workshops, uh, these kind of workshops, make sure you have a clear goal in mind. You know what you want to accomplish with this uh, workshop. I mean, of course, it's good that you that you that you have these workshops and that you kind of you know um, have them co-create and so that they're involved and that it's that it's in part their solution as well. But you should also take a step forward in the process. Uh, after these workshops, you should, you know, uh, you know, be a bit further and, and, and you know, be a bit closer to the to the final results. Um, so don't just do the exercise to make them feel good or give them the feeling that they have the same in design. Um, then uh, I mentioned already earlier, you, you kind of have the right people in the workshop. Um, so your clients, core team, and from some different departments, uh, if possible, some users. Well, what about the, the director at sea level? Well, um, in some cases, he, uh, it, it, in some cases, it's a good idea to to, to, uh, um, to have him in the workshop as well. Um, but just be aware that usually a co-creation workshop takes several hours, and often he doesn't have the time. So it might be that he pops in for two hours and then, then leaves. Again. So just take that into account when you're running these workshops. It kind of it can kind of mess up your schedule a bit, or uh, you know. Um, be prepared for that. Another uh, piece of advice is um, have everyone participate. Because that's always a risk that you can have. That there are a, a few dominant personalities that kind of take over the workshop. And um, there are different ways of avoiding that. Um, and then the introverts get a bit int intimidated and they don't say a word anymore. Um, there are ways to avoid that. Well, one thing is from time to time foresee some private time. For instance, when you do a brainstorm, make sure at the beginning that there's a bit of private time that, um, um, that you don't do in group. Another way of avoiding um, this you know, dominance by one person is to, to work with breakout groups of three or four persons and let them prepare things in, in two or three uh, groups and, and each group presents the results um, of what they've uh, come up with. Then um, also get away from the chairs. I would say um, don't, it's not like the, a sitting with you at a co-creation workshop. Um, have them stand up, have stand up tables for the exercises, so, like a bit higher tables in which you have to work while standing up. It kind of activates, participants will become more active when you, when you do that. So that you avoid what um, 
um, a colleague of mine once had, there was a director participating in the workshop and they were doing a, a post-it session, so we, we gave the post-its to a colleague, so you, know, you hang them on the wall. But that type of thing is not really what you want to what you want to accomplish. Um, um, have a minimum structure in your exercise. That's important. I think structure works well for everyone. Um, structure never harms. It kind of sets the boundaries and leads to what I would call focused creativity. And not creativity that goes in all directions and that in the end you don't know uh, what you've been, uh, what's not very useful or it's not very helpful uh, afterwards. It kind of helps you uh, focus um, um, but still be creative. Be creative within boundaries. Um, another uh, uh, tip is keep the exercise or the exercise relatively simple. Don't make them too complex, because otherwise you will have to explain a lot, and the risk is there that they still don't get it and they, they completely uh, well, they, they, they don't do the exercise well, and so the results is, uh, is of no value. Um, if, um, for instance, I, I can give you a little example for that. Uh, we, we worked on a content strategy project for uh, the Council of the European Union. And in one of the workshops, we wanted to have them create a content model. Now, I don't know who's, if you're all familiar with content models, but they have a kind of a syntax. I mean, you have different content objects and they're related in a certain way, so you can have arrows in a content model, like uh, one-to-many relations or many-to-many. -many. So there's a bit of syntax involved. And now, it's a bit complex for people who don't, who've never seen that. So what, uh, what I did in that case was um, uh, I did a little uh, a simple trial with, it, with a simple example. I took, for instance, a music, a song. I took four uh, content objects, a song, a charge, an album, and an artist. And then I, I let them try out for 10 minutes, and then we discussed a bit. And then they were ready to do the exercise, because the uh, contents is much more complex. There are more content objects. The relations are not really uh, self-evident. But they understood the exercise well. And so they were ready to, um, well, to do the, uh, the real thing then, uh, with a little trial. Then, if possible, make it fun, make it playful. Um, and that's also um, important because that, um, you know, people like games, people like challenges. Uh, it, it, also, it also activates them. And um, for instance, that example of that serious play with the commission, uh, it was a full day workshop and it was just after lunch. Now, usually that's the worst moment in the workshop. People, you know, the stomach is taking all the energy. They're a bit like, uh, they have a dip or they, 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 they're tired. Well, I've never seen a group be as active as they were uh, in that exercise just after lunch. It was really, um, people were all very uh, enthusiastic and they were all, well, they were having fun. That was basically it. So they, 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 they didn't have time to be tired. And that was good. Um, and then, as I said, uh, make sure to register all, all the, uh, the results in detail and document enough what came out of the workshop. Uh, if you don't do that, if you forget to take pictures of, of what was in the whiteboard and, when, and it's gone, then, I mean, then you, you will not remember it. There's so much being said during a workshop like that, there's so much going on. Um, make sure to register enough. Um, risks. What are possible risks when you do uh, a co-creation workshops? Well, um, and this is a quote that I literally got from a client. They said, well, well, we're happy with the project and the way it went, but we were a bit disappointed. Where's your expertise? Because, I mean, they really said, well, we had to, you know, it all had to come from us. Of course, that was not really the case. Probably there was some truth in that as well. But uh, because we were using these co-creation uh, uh, techniques, um, they had to really, you know, come up with uh, things themselves as well and really be involved. And... Um, yeah, sometimes that creates the perception that um, well, we had to do all the work. Well, that's good, I would say. Um, then again, um, you should have the right people in the workshop. Uh, that's a bit what I've been saying. Um, or a bit related to this, that, and that's a risk, um, um, next to not having the right people in the workshop, is also enthusiasm with the people who participated. But then later on, when they show it to colleagues, they're they're less enthusiastic, they were not involved, and they, they don't share the, the same drive, and they don't share the same understanding. So that's always a, a risk. It takes time to run, to prepare these workshops, to run them, to digest the results. Um, so it can be time consuming, but in the end it pays off. Um, and they can be a bit budget burning. Um, 
Um, so one of the risks, that's no more for us, is that you spend most of the time organizing, running, and digesting the results of these workshops, and that you don't have time enough anymore to, you know, to finalize the design for, uh, for the website or whatever you're making. Um, so make sure to uh, foresee enough time for what comes after the workshops. And then my final point is about um, you as a designer who's organizing these workshops and using these co-creation workshop techniques. You will have to adapt a bit uh, as well. Um, you need di a different type of uh, skills. Um, you can't work on your own anymore in your black boxes, uh, as we had them before. Um, so you need workshop facilitation skills. Um, that means keeping, you know, being used to keeping an eye on timing, knowing when to intervene when a discussion, you know, tends to kind of um, get out of control. Um, maybe know when to move on, when to skip an exercise. Um, also, knowledge about people and about group dynamics. And, you know, recognize different types of personalities, social styles, their styles they're called. So um, you can have thinkers or directors or socializers. And know how to react on, on, on these type of uh, personalities. Um, um, but some you have to react a bit differently um, than for others. Um, you have to, you know, be open, be open for criticism. Um, it's not you, the designer, who's going to do the magic, and, and, and it's only about your own ideas. No, it's also about the ideas of the, the people participating. So you have to kind of let go of, uh, of the design and, and, and be open enough to uh, ideas of others. And then uh, um, the last thing that you should have as a skill is kind of ability to translate client's idea directly into some kind of workable solution. Like typically um, visualizing. If, if people come up with a concept that you can kind of make an abstract scheme or sketch it out uh, quickly. And that's not easy. I'm not really good at it. I'm still working on it, but it's, uh, it's something you really need. I mean, usually as a designer, I mean, you have, you have time to think things over and then slowly, I'm a bit, I'm a bit more like the slow type of person that uh, you know, I need some time, but then I, uh, I I can come up with a good result, but here it needs to come much more quickly. You need to be able to react immediately and be very other than. Um. So that was uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope this was useful, and I hope you can start doing some co-creation as well uh, in, in your projects. I would say it's up to you now. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, yeah? I, I'd like to, if you, you have internet, right? Yes. Would you care to show a website that you collaborated on, if you're like one that you really liked, and explain a bit about you know how it went and why you're happy with it? Um, a website because we most to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you usually well from time to time we do websites, but mostly it's it's more like internal uh, products, so it's a bit difficult to okay. to show. We corroborated a bit on capacity for that, but that was. There was very little co-creation. I would do it a bit differently now um, at that project. Um, our, our participation was mainly a few years ago. Um, well, there's the Sony support site. Um, um, well, I can try to show you. I, I haven't looked at it for a while. Um, let me see. I'll um, switch um, in just a second. Sorry. <laughs> but I think it's interesting to see a, a, a result from a perspective where several people committed interesting ideas and they came up with a result that was more interesting than if one, week, one person would have yeah, invented it. You know what I mean? Well, um, I, I talked about the Sony example. Um, Okay, I have it here. So if you, but it, it's been a while. I hope it's, uh, <laughs> one of the things was when I remember uh, when I looked at this um, earlier on is that they um, integrated, for instance, the support things um, um, with the product information. Um, and so when you see a, a, a specific product now that um, support information is, is really easily available there. Um, we also looked at ways, we, we combined it also with a usability test, we did some usability testing in Amsterdam, which of course is not co-creation, but um, that helped us better understand what, uh, 
how these users, um, you know, uh, used that support website and when they needed it. And for instance, most people didn't use it. They, they Googled when they, the things that they want to know. So that was something uh, interesting for us to know. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. I, 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 you can surprise me with this. Well, or you call me with this question. Well, because it's mainly, it's mainly not um, things that you can see in public, um, sure. where we do co-creation uh, on, uh, like the example of PCM platform, I can't show anything online or intranets. Um, uh, any other questions? Yeah, you, uh, you have uh, big companies and big institutions as, as clients. How hard it is to get them to your office uh, to participate in workshops? It depends. In, 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 in some cases, it, 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 it's easy. I think for the commission, I mean, well, they know the, the spaces now, and, and well, you can compare the meeting room uh, the, the, um, at DG Defco with, with, with the, the. So usually they're happy if they can come over and do these kind of workshops. They see also that the value of it, it it's much more inviting. And, and, and for them, they can, you know, they can really focus on, on the exercise then. So, in the case of the commission, it's, uh, it's not difficult at all for the council. Also because we're very close to them. Of course, um, this is where we, we've done projects for SD Works in Antwerp. Uh, that's a bit more difficult. Usually we, we're not able to, to get them to our offices. So mainly it's, it, it's, it's often a, about practical things. Um, when you, you know, sometimes we provide, we say, well, we also provide lunch, and that kind of, kind of helps them <laughs> come over. So these, well, you can use these kind of cheap tricks. Uh, any other questions? We have to consider mobile office. Yeah, but then you're a bit dependent on the, on, on the situation. Well, as you can see, I mean, um, uh, my colleague Leo, who, who kind of tore down the, the boxes, he also has prepared kind of a, 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 cof a coffer, a coffer, uh, uh, um, that, you know, with a suitcase with kind of a, with all the stuff, with the post-its and, and a bit of Lego. So we can bring it along, uh, but you still you need you, well, you need a space with, with lots of whiteboards because that's I think that's the essential element. Uh, we use these whiteboards in many different ways. You can write on the tables and, and, and combine it with uh, Lego and Kapla. You need a bit of a, a kind of a, a flexible rule, otherwise it becomes uh, difficult to do these kind of exercises. It sounds we won't be respect. It sounds like a very expensive exercise. And therefore. I understand it's only applicable to large projects. Um, how many staff, for example, do you have to uh, involve from your end in such a preparation workshop? Is it one usually we're two. Specific, usually we're two. Only two. Yeah, sometimes three, but usually, uh, in most cases, it's two persons. One kind of leading or moderating the workshop, and one person helping out, and, and, and you know, taking care of all the registrations. And there is a bit of you know a bit of support staff to set up the design studio, depending on how many people are coming, what kind of exercises we do, or making sure that the lunch is there if it's a full day workshop. And is technical feasibility of any importance in this stage? Do you yeah. care about that? Absolutely no. It's it's when something is not feasible, um, technically feasible, it's no no use brainstorming about it and saying, wow, this is what we're gonna. So usually um, we we try to involve IC. Well, we, we, we prefer having ICT as well, even if um, if it's for instance for the commission, it's usually with a contractor. So if possible, if they know already what the contractor, who the contractor will be, we try to get them uh, participate in the workshop as well. A bit like we did at Peter. It was not really we did we did we did it, we did do a few workshops in the beginning, uh, but not uh, in an extensive way like I've presented here. But then um, it was uh, really good that uh, that Complexo was already. Uh, um, had the contract, so we knew they were going to build it, and they were going to. It was about a, it was a Drupal project in that case, so um, and they were always around. Uh, they had to be there in the workshop, so we, we wouldn't want it uh, without them. Would it be possible to do any indication of minimal size of a project budget that is, uh, you know, that is worth it to, to involve you guys for these kind of workshops? You know, yeah, my boy, this, uh, this uh, Johannes, uh, one of the three managing partners and, and, co and founder of the company, he says 10k. Yeah. Well, uh, then you have a few workshops. I mean, it's not uh, that, that we're going to, you know, prototype for two weeks after that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, 
uh, so this would be 10A, with so one, one song preparation, a one day workshop, and then some follow-up. Yeah, and a project. So that four, so that, you know, we have the, 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 the stones for the central place. The central place of this 10 day uh, project is, is the co creation workshop. We bring it together. We're running a few projects at that price range. One last it was like, but but I was involved in those for uh, DG Comment and and, and and Digit, and it was less because uh, well, we didn't have a framework contract, so it was more on a, on a one or two workshop basis that they said, well, we would like you to run a workshop on on service design and agile, for instance, and then it was two workshops and together it was something like that, ten k or even a bit less. Any other remarks or questions about what the time? Oh, we still have time. I have one thing actually. After, so during the day, they come up with a lot of designs and new stuff, and new document, they document, they take pictures, or they make big drawings, but one, then they go to their office, well, they go back, right? Then do you, like, do you make PDFs or everything and then send it to them? Do they somehow get the results yeah. of what they and how do you do that? Well, um, it, it, to me, it's, it's, it's mostly a Word document. Um, I kind of give an overview again of the exercises, the steps we've taken. And I combine pictures of, uh, like the picture of, of the, the serious play, um, together with what, what has been said or, or the story that came out, came out of it. So uh, I, it's, it's registering, but it's taking already well, a little step further. So it's a combination of just registrations, like pictures, um, but then also, um, you know, a scenario that has been, you know, um, uh, telegram style, been written uh, on a whiteboard. I kind of, you know, make make, you know, make sentence out of phrase out of make it a full narrative. So, um, so it's still the same story that they came up with, or is it or is still the same persona? But it's already a bit cleaned up and, uh, you know, a bit, a bit more detailed. So something that they can really, uh, you know, start working with. And I usually send it in words, uh, a report like that. So they have the text and they can, you know, they can use it uh, later on. If they, if they want to. So it's not that much different from other types of exercises you would do, I suppose. So. If it's a small project and, and there are not a lot of people in the company, uh, how many people uh, would do the workshop? Yeah, it depends. You can do that with three or four people. Usually it's around 10. Um, uh, and for instance, the projects for the commissioner for the council with 10 rooms, sometimes 11, 12 people. A bit from different departments. But the more people you have, the more difficult it starts to get to, you know, to run these workshops. And uh, um, when you split up into groups, like... Yes, that's, that's, I mean, I think if a good size, I mean, the minimum is like four, because you, you want to bring in some games, some gamification, you want to make it playful, so you want to have two groups who compete on the same problem, you know, a few times. So then you need two uh, from, you know, two, two groups of two people, ideally, and, and from at least two different departments, so it doesn't cross disciplinarity. So four is a minimum, twelve is a maximum, because then you have three, work, three uh, breakout sessions with four people each. Yep. That becomes, that if you need to Presents in the plenary session, and then it becomes a bit long. So, yeah, between four and twelve. Yeah, if you have like five people in a group, five persons, then you can be you can be pretty sure that like two or three are not participating yeah. anymore. So, it's a bit uh, you know it's a bit of a trade-off. Sometimes they want to come with many people, but okay, you can come, but not you can come with like ten to twelve, but not with twenty because then really it's not. And it's more like that you you start to, to get into more into presentation modes um, when you're talking. With, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you very much for, for listening to me. And, uh,